morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral, and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. We are so excited that you have chosen to worship with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and you can watch our live services on YouTube. For more information about the church and how you can get connected, you can visit our website, ehconline.org. Now join us as Bishop Collins delivers a powerful, timely message. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 30 through 35. Matthew 26, 30 through 35. And in that passage of scripture, Jesus is sharing with his disciples in the final communion just before his crucifixion. And it is there that he lets them know that there is someone sitting at the table who will in a few short moments betray him. And if you've been in church for any time, you know that that is Judas. But I want us to pick up at verse 30, for it will lay the foundation for today's message. Verses 30 through 35, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Then saith Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men should be offended because of these, yet I will not be offended, never. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times you will say you don't know me. And Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Listen very carefully now. Likewise also said all the disciples. Now go with me to verses 55 through 56. For it is at this place that the enemies of Jesus, they have come to take him away with swords drawn. And the story goes that Peter takes out his sword and he cuts off one of the ears of the servant of the high priest. And Jesus said to his disciples, he said, put away your sword because all those that take up the sword will perish by the sword. And in verse 53 through 54, he says, Do you think and not understand that if I wanted to, all I would have to do is pray to my father, and he would dispatch 12 legions of angels, church, that's 72,000 angels, and he would turn this place into a parking lot. Then he said, But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled so this must happen? Pay close attention to the next verses, two verses, especially verse 56. In that same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Are ye come against me as a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. Verse 56, Jesus said, But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Now here it comes, church. Here it comes. Watch this. Then all the disciples, everybody say all. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Now we read that scripture and Peter always gets the bad rap. But what I want us to grasp is this. When Peter made those statements, he said, I will never leave you, Jesus. The disciples also nodded their heads and said, we're with you too, Jesus. But the most obvious point is overlooked. And it is that they all backed Peter up. They all made the same promise, but they all ran except Peter. Stay with me now. I want to ask you a question today that I don't want you to answer right now until the end of the message. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus Christ? Watch now. There is a pastor by the name of Kyle Eidelman who wrote a book. It's called Not a Fan, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. Now, I've never read that book. But as I was researching, I came across some of his powerful quotes. Let me give you two of them and then we're going to pray. He said, the biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Fans don't mind him doing little touch-up work. But Jesus wants complete renovation. Fans come to Jesus thinking tune-up, but Jesus is thinking overhaul. Fans think a little makeup is fine, but Jesus is thinking makeover. Fans think a little decorating is required, but Jesus wants a complete remodel. Fans want Jesus to inspire them, but Jesus wants to interfere with their lives. Can I ask you again today, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Father, before we sing this one more time, examine all of our hearts from this platform to the seats that are in front of me. 
Lord, when people today decide I'm no longer walking on the fence. I'm no longer being that person that follows Jesus from a distance. But we're going to get close and personal with you. And when we do, we will be changed and the world will be changed for time and eternity. May we go out of here being people that value your presence in our lives. And I thank you for it, that it's going to happen because we believe for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now open up your mouth and declare to the Lord and ask him again today. Say, Lord, prepare me. Lord, prepare me. Come on, Jesus. Does anybody else want to be pure and holy? Well, you got to be tried so you'll be found true. When God is done, then with thanksgiving, I will be, I'll be a living, oh sanctuary. If you don't know the words, they're up there, so you can sing them. Say it one more time. Say, Lord, prepare me. Say, Lord, prepare me. I want to be a sanctuary. Jesus, do it, Jesus. Do it in me, Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to begin by giving you some observations concerning fans. Some fans are faithful. Now, all my days of growing up, there were only three basketball teams that mattered to me, and they only still matter today. And they are in this order. The Chicago Bulls, the Los Angeles Lakers, and the Boston Celtics. Everybody else is just playing. Those teams matter. Now, don't throw a tomato at me because my favorite football team is still the Dallas Cowboys. And don't hiss because my favorite baseball team is the New York Yankees. You know why? Because I'm faithful. Whew. I feel the heat over here somewhere. Let me tell you a second thing about fans. Fans are flaky. Now, let me just tell you, Mark, our cowboys have been playing more like the cow toys, but I'm sticking with them. Am I right? Deacon Reuben. But we're going to stick with them anyway because if anything irritates me, it is fair weather fans. Those who stay to a certain point, if their, continue, their, their team continues to lose, they're gone. The third type of fan is fans can be fickle. They'll stay with you, but if you lose too much, they will sit and boo you. Or they'll get up and they'll walk out during the middle of the game. I will never forget the one game that Lady Brenda and I were at, and the Celtics were losing by 14 points, and there was less than five minutes to play. And all of a sudden, we looked around, and the seats were empty. I mean thousands, if, if not thousands. They got up and they walked out. And I was so excited because the Celtics, they came back and they won the game. And then I went to my health club the next day, and I could hear all these guys complaining. Wow, we missed it. And I would have said something, but they were all bigger than me. I wanted to say, that's because y'all are fickle fans. Number four, fans can be fanatical, hence the word fan. When I think about fanaticism, my mind flashed back to July 29, 1981, when Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer tied the proverbial knot. Their marriage was widely billed as the fairy tale wedding and the wedding of the century, which ended as the divorce of the century. But what amazed me was not only that when two human beings came together, 750 million people not only viewed it, but it is said that up to one million well-wishers got on a plane and flew to the site. And I thought, wait a minute now, Lady Brenda and I got married five months later, and her dress was in the same magazine as Lady Di's. Our wedding was small. We had a small reception. Those ham sandwiches were good. 
such as the life of a college student. But isn't it amazing that people will fly and spend thousands of dollars just to go see people who are made of the same dirt that we're all made of? That's what happens when you're fanatical. Number five, fans can be foolish. When fanship is carried too far, it can be crazy. The story came up again where the young man that was beaten into a comatose state by two Los Angeles fans simply because he wore his San Francisco Giants jersey to the stadium. It is said that he still suffers from the effects of it, both physically and emotionally. Let me say something that is very important this morning. God has placed within every human being the need for fellowship. There is a desire in every last one of us for relationship. That's why God created man so that he might have someone to have fellowship and relationship with. Then the Bible says that he makes for man a woman because we also needed fellowship and relationship. But there is also something that seems to be a vacuum within the soul of every human being. And that is a vacuum for fanship. It seems that we all need someone to look up to, to believe in. And there also seems to be a need in all of mankind that we need to be the ones who others look up to. But Jesus said, I did not come to build a fan base. I came to build followers. And I came to call people to take up their cross and follow me. To take up your cross of Jesus, it means that I do what he would do. I say what he would say. I'll be what he would be. And no matter how difficult the situation might be, no matter what the sacrifice you have to make, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. You know what that means? Here it comes now. It means that the body of Christ has to do something that we're not wanting to do. We have to die to our flesh. We have to die to our will and do the Father's will. And don't miss it. Church, I want us to understand today that that is the goal for God from us, for every single living, breathing, waking, gifted day of our life. So I have to ask you again, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Please understand, I didn't ask if you go to church regularly, though you should if you claim to be a Christian. I didn't ask if you were born and raised in a Christian home. I didn't ask if you ever walked to this altar and filled out one of those little sitters, I came to Jesus card. I didn't ask if you are a regular attender of Eagle Heights Cathedral or any other church. I don't even know what, how many versions of the Bible you possess. I don't want to know how many churches you left before you landed here. I don't even want to know if your phone rings, does it pop up and say, we're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the field. Let me drill down a little bit deeper because today I want you to know I don't want to know if you can pray with the tongues of men and angels and the angels themselves stop to listen to your oration. I don't want to know if you have a tithe number and if you used it today. I don't want to know anything about you this day but this one thing. I want to know, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus Christ? Let me quote Kyle Eidelman once again and then we're going to move on. He said, it may seem that there are many followers of Jesus, but if they were to honestly define the relationship they have with him, I am not sure it would be accurate to describe them as followers. It seems to me that there are, is a more suitable word to describe them. They are not followers of Jesus. Here is the most basic definition of fan in the dictionary, an enthusiastic admirer. It's the guy who goes to the football game with no shirt and a painted chest. He sits in the stands and he cheers the team. He's got a signed jersey hanging on the, his wall at home and multiple bumper stickers on the back of his car. But he's never in the game. He never breaks a sweat or takes a hard hit in the open field. He knows all about the players and can rattle off their latest stats, but he doesn't know the players. He yells and he cheers, but nothing is really required of him. There's no sacrifice he has to make. And the truth is, as excited as he seems, if the team he's cheering for starts to let him down and has a, and a few off seasons, his passion will wane pretty quickly. After several losing seasons, you can expect him to jump off the fan wagon and begin cheering for some other team. He is an enthusiastic admirer. Church, I read that to you because we need to have a reality check in the body of Christ. This is the majority of the people who say they love Jesus. And because of that, please understand, I say this with love, but the body of Christ is overrun with high maintenance, no low impact Christians. And I fear that there are more fans than followers of Jesus in the kingdom. 
I have told you that one of the reasons is because some of us preachers have sincerely wanted to bring people into the kingdom. But we have made the mistake of trying to make Jesus look so attractive and giving people this idea that coming to him is easy and comfortable as possible. And we are more concerned about offending people into the kingdom than we are that we are offending the king of the kingdom. And there is a scripture that we like to claim and quote, but I don't know if we really understand the fullness thereof. I was meditating on Psalm 37 and 4 where it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 27 says, God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And I want you to know that when we come into Christ, I want you to understand that he wants you to give you, give you every desire of your heart. And God really does want to bless you. And he finds joy when you are blessed. But let me give you the purest translation of Psalm 37 and 4. It literally means become a follower of Jesus and God will give you the desires of your heart. I want to ask it again. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? When I talk about fans, I'm, I'm not talking about following Jesus. I'm not talking about groupies. What we're talking about here is being sold out. That place where you value his presence more than anything else in your life. For the sake of retention, let me be purposely redundant. I know here's what you're thinking. Here he comes again. Yes, I do. There is something that has been lost in the body of Christ, and it is a fear and a reverence of a holy God. And if we do not fear him, we cannot reverence him. And if we do not reverence him, we cannot worship him. If we do not worship him, he does not come. And if he does not come, he is not exalted. And if he is not exalted, he does not make his enemies his footstool. And then we learn that we lost some things, and I'm not going to go through those. But let me begin to ask it one more time and then begin to give you some characteristics of fans. Let me ask you again, are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Now let me introduce you to a reality. Fan club is big. There is nothing unique about that club. It's overrun. So let me give you the first thought. Jesus fans follow him only for what they can receive. Only for what they can receive. In John 6, there is this scene where Jesus is speaking to a crowd. And you need to understand that that crowd was numbered well over 15,000 people. And Jesus, who was the greatest preacher, and listen, the, the greatest teacher to ever walk on this earth, he is out there and he is at the peak of his popularity. And we're going to see that even those people in that day, they made Jesus into their celebrity. His reputation had gone before him, for they had heard about all the miracles, the healings, and the deliverances, and the crowds of thousands came in fan support. They were intent in cheering Jesus on. And at the end of the day, watch this now, Jesus had been preaching all day long, and you think I preach long. Jesus had been preaching so long that he looked at those people and he keyed in and he was in on the fact that the people were hungry and he turns to his disciples and he asks Philip in particular in verse 5, where shall we buy bread for these people? And Philip says, Lord, even if we had eight months salary, there wouldn't be enough money to buy bread for everyone to get a bite. Now in the eyes of, of, of this man in Philip, he has seen the need as an impossible need to be met. But then Andrew, who had also been looking over the crowd, he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, there's a little boy over there. His mama took him to McDonald's on the way to the meeting. That little boy has got five McBuns and two fish in there. Jesus takes that little boy's lunch and he does what only Jesus can do. He turns that thing into a McMeal that is able to feed 15,000 plus people. And the Bible says that when the meal was over, every one of them had had their fill. There was plenty left over, which tells me, church, that when God meets your need, he always does it in excess of what you need. For he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. And after the dinner, the crowd decides they're just going to camp out for the night. Because what they are after is just hanging out with Jesus and hear me. These people are big time Jesus fans. They understand that he is the Super Bowl entertainment. Stay with me now. The next day the crowd wakes up in the morning. And true to Christians, you know we like the five F's. Food, fun, fellowship, food, 
and food. Now watch this. They begin to look for their meal ticket. Everybody say Jesus. But he's nowhere to be found, and they are hoping to see him do again what he did last night. They wanted to see him take somebody's McGrill, their sausage, and their Paul Newman coffee and make the breakfast over again for 15,000 groupies like he did with the boys' lunch. They are on their hunt to find Jesus. The story goes that Jesus and his disciples crossed over to the other side of the lake. And by the time they expend all their energy finding Jesus, please understand, they are no longer hungry. They're hungry. When you are starving, you ain't hungry. you hungry. And you spell it H-O-N-G-R-Y. Now stay with me. They missed their chance for breakfast. But believe me when I tell you this, they were ready to find out what's on the lunch menu. But watch Jesus. Jesus said, not this time. I'm not going to lay out for you an all-you-can-eat fish buffet. He said, listen, I'm not pulling an Oprah Winfrey free car type of thing with food anymore. John 6, 26 through 27, listen to what Jesus says. He says, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate loaves and had your fill. Hear what Jesus says. He says, I want you to understand, I know why you're following me. You're not coming after me with all this zeal and all this sacrifice because you saw the mighty hand of God at work and you value his presence. You are coming after me only because you want some free food. You don't, you don't want what I have to offer. You want what you can get out of me. Now watch verse 35 when he hits him with this. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Don't miss that one. He says, I am the bread of life. All of a sudden, you know what Jesus said? He said, I want y'all to understand that right now from this point on, I'm the only thing on the menu. And they said, where's the beef or the fish, if you will? Jesus was saying to what I'm hoping the Holy Spirit is conveying to us today. He wants to know, and he's trying to teach them, if God doesn't give us anything else, is he still going to be God in our lives? Is Jesus more than enough? And Jesus was saying, if I don't give you anything else, and I don't give you more stuff, and if I don't bless you according to the world's standards, tell me, will I be enough to satisfy you? Or are you after something else? Here's what we read at the end of chapter In John 6, 66, watch this now. When Jesus challenges them, this Bible says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. See it now. When there was no more natural bread, they left him. When there were no more material blessings, they left him. And I want you to notice this, church. Jesus didn't chase after them. And please understand that I'm not being me. But I'm sick and tired of immature Christians. You disappear from church. And we don't see you for a month of Sundays. And then all of a sudden, you pop back up in church. And yes, we ask you where you've been. Well, I've been going through some stuff and nobody called me. Let me help us. The problem is we got to grow up. Some of us have been saved since... Noah built the ark, and we still can't grow up. We haven't grown up, and so we're only happy and blessed when we are happy and blessed, when everything is going our way, but the question still hangs in the air. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Jesus wants to know, will you follow me if I never give you one more blessing? If I never give you a big house, if I never give you a fancy car, if your dreams never come true, if I never heal you but you have to depend on the doctors for the rest of your life, will you follow me? But I got good news for you this morning, church. I want you to know that I know this defies the logic of the human Christian's mind. But please understand, I got good news. It is a verifiable impossibility not to be blessed when you come to the place where Jesus and Jesus is alone. He's all you need. Number two, Jesus fans want to know how close they can dance with the world and still go to heaven. Matthew 19, 16 through 26, we find the story of the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and he asks the question that is in the heart of every human being. Because the Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. He says, teacher, you're a good teacher. 
What must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus replied in verse 17, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want eternal life, obey the commandments. And he says to Jesus, which ones? Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. And I can see him as he's smiling. He looks at Jesus. He says, Jesus, I got this because I've been doing all of those. Then he says, what else? You never ask Jesus what else. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus said. If you want to be perfect, that is spiritually mature, ooh, ooh, here it comes. Go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Verse 22 says, when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. That's a good place to go, Sila. Then Jesus said to his disciples in verse 23, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, please understand that Jesus is not taking a jab at rich people or is he being mean about people being wealthy. He is saying this, rich people can go to heaven, but it's difficult for most of them because all they look at is what they possess. What Jesus was after, he was asking the question, who had whom? And we found out that the man's money had him, not he having the money. What Jesus was asking is this, and he's asking of all of us, what in this world are you willing to let go of in order to inherit eternal life? Watch this now. I believe that if that man had responded appropriately, he would have found out what many of you and I have found out, that the day that you release in your hand toward God, God will release what's in his hand toward you. And he's got a whole lot bigger hand than your hand, and if you will just let go, but so many of us are so busy trying to see how much worldly stuff we can accumulate and hold on to and still reap the blessings of eternal life. I'm going to say it one more time. The stuff you hold tightly to is not your source. God is the source. The stuff is the manifestation of the source. The rich young ruler's wealth was symbolic of how many people we want to see how closely we can stay connected to the world, do things the way the world does it, talk and think the way the world operates, and still go to heaven. Number three. Jesus fans are only moved by emotion and feeling. Matthew 21, 1 through 11, in most Bibles, it is titled the triumphant entry. It is the scene that we usually read on Palm Sunday where Jesus comes riding into the city on a donkey. Verse 8 says this, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, those that shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, I want to make two historical observations about this scripture because they're important. First of all, it is the first time that Jesus comes into Jerusalem that way. See, in the past, he had always come in the same way that the sheep were herded into the city gates. But this day, he comes in on the back of a donkey, and he rides straight into the middle of the city. Now, we have to understand this. In the biblical days, if you owned a donkey, that means that you were wealthy. And that means that you rode in on the most expensive car that money could buy. And Jesus came into town on that day on the back of the don donkey because this time he's not coming as the shepherd. He is coming in to make the statement that I am king of kings and lord of lords. And that day, he says, now I'm going to give you a point of decision. You're going to have to decide today if you believe that I'm the a king of glory or you just think I'm just a something or other stay with him now and the Bible says that many of them chose the latter for when they asked among themselves who is this the response was oh that's Jesus that prophet from Nazareth of Galilee I want you to see this church these were the same people who were some of those who in John 6 they saw Jesus take a little boy's sack lunch and he fed over 15,000 people, yet they say he is no big deal. He's just a prophet. The second observation is this. These that are cheering would later be the same ones just a week later yelling crucify. Isn't it amazing how we can just praise people in one breath and before we finish breathing, start to curse them? Let me repeat this and don't miss this. These are the same ones who had seen him feed 15,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. And now they're moved with their emotion and their feeling. And watch now, one week later when the emotion and the feelings have worn off. Come on, somebody. 
Because we get really emotional in church sometimes, don't we? And before we get home, the emotion and the feeling has worn off if we haven't been in the spirit. Listen now, folks. When the feelings have worn off, when the memories of the miracles have eclipsed their minds, they yell crucify. And Jesus says to them in John 16, 22 through 25, if I had come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen miracles and yet yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. Let me talk to us, church. When you are a fan and not a follower of Jesus, you have no depth of relationship with him. So therefore, you are always moved by your emotions and your feelings. And when things aren't going in your favor, when times get tough, and they do get tough for everybody at some time or another, and when they do, the fans, your emotions and your feelings, I promise you, they will betray you. Because listen up, Jesus made us a real promise. He said, I'm going to promise you this. In this world, you're going to have difficulties. In this world, you will have trials and tests. In this world, there will be times when Christians don't treat you right. In this world, there will be times when life is not fair. In this world, you are going to get hurt and you have done nothing to deserve it. In this world, you're going to fight sickness and disease like everybody else. In this world, listen to me, church, every day is not going to be your favorite day. But he also said in John 16, 33, I didn't tell you all these things to make you feel bad. I told them to you that you might have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Cheer up. Wipe that sad sack look off your face because I've overcome the world. You know what that means? The world can touch you, but it cannot destroy you. The world can bend you, but it cannot break you. Jesus says, I have assured you that no matter what you go through, no matter the battle, you're going to make it because I overcame the world. Then I deposited in you the spirit of an overcomer. You're going to make it. Listen now. But when you're just a fan and a follower of Jesus, you don't have the root system that you need to endure the storms of life. Because what you're depending on is emotions and feelings which are flighting and have no root. They are up and down. The only way to have a root system that will just survive the storms of life is you begin, first of all, with John 15, 4 through 5. John 15, 4 through 5. This is Jesus talking again. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine so neither can you unless you abide in me I am the vine you are the branches he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing that's something that the church has got to understand you doing all this stuff and you think that you're doing it in your own might and your power let me talk to you for a minute the only reason we get up to do anything is because God decided I'm going to breathe life into you one more time it's because God decided I'm going to give you the strength to do what you do but God says never ever misunderstand the fact that I have blessed you with life that you are doing what you do on your own behalf and see there's the problem with fanship you will never have the root system to sustain yourself through the storms of life until you come to the place where you learn to abide in him and how are you going to abide in him everybody say eat the word daily See, some of y'all, the only time you eat the word is when I'm preaching. Ooh -hoo. Let me talk to you. You got to feast on the word daily. When you got no preacher with a microphone and you got no preacher with a big mouth like mine, when you've got no church to go into, but it's you and God in your own little cubby. It might be in your bedroom. You may have to seclude yourself in the shower, but get in there. Don't turn on the water. Turn on the word and begin to digest it. Here's why. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the paths of sinner, nor sit in the seat of scorners. Now, why is this man who is blessed not doing the things that keep him from being blessed? Because he don't have time to waste time in the company of those kind of people. Let me say it once again. Your friends determine your destiny. Show me your friends. I'll show you you. 
Listen to me. This man is too busy doing the rest of verse 2. But his, the law is in the, his delight is in the law, the word of the Lord. And in his law, he does meditate day and night. I love what the old saints used to sing, Dr. Hill. You know this one. It's the B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. It's the B-I-B-L-E. Oh, you ain't going to help me. I just felt like going back to my childhood. Let me talk to you. See, let me tell you something. Sometimes when I'm going through a storm, I don't flip and go crazy through my Bible. I open it up to Psalm 91. He who abides under the shelter of the Almighty. Mm. So when the winds of trial begin to blow, they bend me, but they don't break me because my root system runs deep in the B-I-B-L-E. And because hell comes to bear in my life, everything is going to be all right. Because before hell came, I had meditated on the law of God, the word of God day and night. And here's what God says. That man, he will be like a tree firmly planted by the rivers of living water, which yields its fruits in this season. Why does he say be planted? Because there's a part of you that no Nobody can see. It is the roots that go way down into the dirt. Nobody can see it, but it's being bathed in the Holy Ghost water. And so when the storms of life come, it bends you, but it does not break you. Watch this now. When you meditate on the word of God, you're developing your root system to the place that when the storms come, they bend. But, but watch this now. Then you got to double down on the word with a prayer life according to 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Paul says, praise without ceasing. You know what that means? Pray without breaks. Pray in the good times. No break. Pray in the dark times. Pray in the bad times. Pray in the light times. In the blessed times, pray. In the struggle times, pray. In the healthy times, pray. In the times of sickness, pray. In the times of gain, pray. In the times of loss, pray. When you are in whatever state you are in, even if it's in the state of struggle or blessing, pray. Woo, and then, while you're praying, now here comes a good one. Thank God through what you're going through. I didn't say thank God for what you're going through. I said, thank God through what you're going through. And don't thank God for the problem. Thank God while you're going through the problem. Why? 2 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Let me tell you what I've learned that the church does not like to hear, especially the fans. Please understand that you fans need to hear this. Sometimes struggle is God's will for you. Come on, somebody. Come on. Miguel, stand up for a minute. Stand up. I want you to see this young man. Now, there's something underneath that shirt that you can't see. I don't want to embarrass you, son, but this young brother is ripped. He doesn't have a six-pack. He has a 12. Let me, you can sit down, son. Let me tell you why he's that way. Because he goes in the gym and he puts up a struggle. He pushes the weight when he doesn't want to. He does his cardio when he doesn't want to. Sometimes it's a struggle just to get to the gym. I know because I work out. I try to anyway. I go to the gym and I work out. And let me tell you something. It is not always a joy to go there. But when I get there and when it's done, I find out that something has happened on the inside of me. The struggle has made me able to know what fans never know. That God is able, according to Romans 8.28, to take and make something good come out of the most gut-riching, painful trials in life. Because, listen, the fan, they play off of emotions and feelings. They're always in play. And let me tell you something about the Western world church that we need to learn, that we need to add to this. Particularly American churches. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir mostly in this church because some of y'all been around a while. But most, a whole lot of Western world Christians, we don't know how to stay planted in one church. 
And then we wonder why our spiritual roots are weak. There are some people, they jump out of one church to the next church, and you can't grow that way. Any parent with a sound mind will never rip their child out of a school every year and take them to a new school because they know it's detrimental to their education. Yet we will stunt our growth by going from church to church, not understanding that our spiritual health is more important than our natural health. Now watch this. Most movers are victims of the grasses greener syndrome. They think if they can get in the right church and get the right preacher, everything's going to be all right. It's not, because that's not your answer. Because your root system is unhealthy. That's the problem. Please write this down. It's a beautiful saying. This is deep. No root, no fruit. Now, everybody should be writing me a check for that. That was big. <laughs> Let me say something, too. This is important. Just because you're in this building every week doesn't mean you're rooted. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Because you know what it means to be rooted? I'm connected. And that means, listen, listen. I understand Psalm 92, 13. Those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. It means that all of a sudden your root system is so deep in relationship with Jesus that you don't stop coming to church because what people say to you no longer phases you. What people say about you no longer phases you. What they say behind you no longer phases you. And what they do to you no longer phases you because you are no longer moved by your emotions and your feelings, but rather you are standing, rooted, Grounded in the good soil. Man, if Lady Brenda and I left, every time somebody in these 24 years did or said something to us that hurt, well, you know. In the 1890s, there was a man by the name of Blondin who was a tightrope walker. One day in the 1890s, he strung that tightrope from across Niagara Falls. As he did that, there were 10,000 people screaming. They were fans, if you will. He inched his way from the Canadian side of the falls to the United States side. When he got there, the crowd was shouting, Blondin, 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 Blondin. And finally, he raised his hand, and he displayed a picture of what an oversized ego can do. He quieted that crowd and he shouted to them, I am Blondin, do you believe in me? And the crowd shouted back, we believe, we believe, we believe. Again, he quieted that crowd and once again he shouted to them, I'm going back across that tightrope, but this time I'm going to carry someone on my back. Do you believe I can do that? The crowd yelled again, we believe, we believe, we believe. Then he quieted them one more time and he said, who will be that person? Stone silence. Quiet. Finally, one man came out of the crowd, climbed on Blondin's back, and for the next three and a half hours, Blondin inched his way back across that type rope to the Canadian side of the falls. And what I want to convey to us today, folks, is there are people that gather in churches all over America and they sing and they dance and they shout to a God they say they believe in, a God they trust. But let me talk to us about believing. Believing is not just singing about the glory of God and dancing and shouting and amening or hearing or even preaching about the glory of God. Believing is believing. It is showing that I am in the glory of God and I trust him no matter what I'm going through that is what believing is one of my mentoring pastors texted me today after I had texted every one of them and said I want you to know man of God I'm praying for you today and one of them texted me back and he said you know bishop I needed that today because I'm really struggling I texted him back and I said son let me talk to you the greater and the higher the call, the greater the warfare. But you're going to make it because your destiny is greater than your struggle. But you can't tell anybody that if you don't believe it. And see, fans won't and can't do that. 
Only followers of Jesus can do that. Number four, Jesus fans leave open doors of opportunity for Satan to use them. John 13, 21 through 30, Jesus tells his disciples that one of them is going to betray him. They begin to look around the room at one another. And I want you to notice what they're doing. They're looking around the table and they're trying to see who's going to be the dirty rat. And now, now stay with me for a moment. We know in the end that it was Judas that he betrayed him. And there are those who say that Judas knew all along that he was the one, that when Jesus picked him, he knew that Judas was never right with God. I don't believe either of those things. While I do know that Jesus knew that Judas was the one, I do not believe that Judas knew that he was the one. And neither was Judas picked because he was born for this purpose. Let me show you something. What I do believe is that Judas ended up being the one because Judas left a perfect door of opportunity open for the devil to walk through and use him. John 13, 24 through 27 says, Simon Peter therefore gestured to him, tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He leaning back thus on Jesus' breast said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus therefore answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he did dip the morsel, he took and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Listen up now. And after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. That Jesus therefore said to him, go do what you do and do it quickly. Now notice what happens. Judas immediately leaves the room and he goes from there and the Bible says right after that, he goes and he makes a deal to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of lousy silver for a month's wage. Now stay with me because here cometh the lesson. John 12, 1 through 8. It is the story of Mary, the one in whom Jesus cast out seven demons. In her gratefulness, the Bible says, and her desire to worship him, she comes to Jesus with this costly perfume that she had inherited. She takes the thing, she breaks it open, she pours the whole bottle on Jesus, and he bathes, she bathes him in it. Now, let me help you understand how expensive that perfume was. In today's money, that perfume was valued between six to $80,000. I get this notion that when you're truly glad to be redeemed, there is no act of worship that is too expensive for our Jesus. She pours a perfume on Jesus' head, and the Bible says some of the disciples began to complain. In particular, one is pointed out, John 12, verse 4 through 6. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Listen very closely. Here's why I love John. Now, others of the Gospels, they tell this story. But you know what John does? John says, Hey, I ain't leaving out any details. I'm going to tell the truth about this rat. Watch what he says. Now, he said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, see, he was the treasurer in Jesus' ministry. He used to pilfer what was put in it. Can I explain this to you? Judas left an open door that Satan walked through. And what was that door? Don't miss this. It was the fact that he had a problem in his life, but it was not just a problem. It was a sinful habit in his life that he refused to deal with. He was a thief. He didn't betray, betray Jesus because he hated him. Don't miss that. He betrayed Jesus because he had an addiction, the sin in his life. That even though he loved Jesus, he loved his addiction, his sin more than he loved Jesus. Hear me and believe me when I tell you this. When you are a fan rather than a follower of Jesus, you are more prone to leaving doors open. So sin, a sin, so the devil can walk in and not only use them against someone else, but even against you. Church, listen to me. All of us need to be aware that whatever you don't deal with, the devil will make sure that at some point in your life, it will deal with you. We need to be sure of that. Watch this now. The Memphis Commercial Appeal, it carried the story of a man across the river in Arkansas who had a pet rattlesnake. He found it as a baby. He fed it and he made a pet of it. The reptile would come when he whistled. It would eat from his fingers. It would coil around his arm and it would let him stroke his head with the palm of his hand or with the tips of his fingers. One day he went into town to exhibit it among his friends. They marveled at his gentleness, at the way it would coil itself around his arm and eat from his hand and come when he whistled. 
he went back home with his pet when suddenly, without slightest provocation, that reptile became angry. Quicker than a lightning flashes from the bosom of a dark cloud, that pet rattler buried its fangs in that man's arm. A few hours later, that man was dead. For in one quick instant, with poisonous fangs, the serpent had written his death in his own blood. Two nights later, that man, who should have been sitting with his family in their humble but happy home, was sleeping in the mud of an Arkansas grave. Can I talk to us about sin for a minute? If we make a pet of our favorite sin or sins, let me be clear. That sin has the poison of death in its fangs, for the wages of sin is still death. Here's what I want us all to know. There is a calling from God for us to make a complete break from sin. When we give our lives to Christ, we need to learn to lean on him and trust in him. And then we need to have the courage that when there is sin in our life, not to try and hide it, but to expose it. For what I expose to Jesus, he will take it and he will heal me of it. And let me tell you something, what the devil is after. He is after, obviously, he wants to kill you. But you know what I think is a worse fate than the devil killing us? is him destroying everything that you love and letting you live. That's what he's after. Number five. This is the last. Jesus' fans follow from a distance. Jesus not only told his disciples that one of them would betray him, he took Peter off to the side and he set this conversation with Pete and he said, Pete, I know you think you're solid rock because your name is Petra, which means rock. And I know you think that because you got a great revelation concerning me. And I told you that flesh and blood did not uh, bring it to you and reveal it to you, but it was rather the spirit. And I know that I told you that Peter, upon that revelation, I will build my church. And on that truth, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I know that you think because of all those things that you have received you think you're a spiritual giant and he said but Pete I want you to know you're not there yet and the day is coming when you will betray me now I told you last week that old Pete there had the nerve to rebuke Jesus and that is a clear sign he had fallen off of his spiritual wagon and his rocker when you have the audacity to to rebuke Jesus God in the flesh Hear the modern version of what he said to Jesus. He said, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. Do you know how many times I have people come to me for counseling and then sit across the desk and in so many words say, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me help you. Peter says, it doesn't matter if everybody else forsakes you. I'm your guy. I'll never forsake you. And Jesus, we know, told him, this is what's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. Now go with me to Matthew 26, 57 through 58. Matthew 26, 57 through 58. And those who seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were together. But also Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Please, let's learn four lessons from Peter. Number one, when you follow Jesus from a distance, you will inevitably become lukewarm. It's just a matter of time. There is no doubt about it. I remind us of Revelation 3, 15 through 16, where Jesus is addressing the spiritual atmosphere in the church and the hearts of the people of Laodicea. They were a very wealthy church. You need to understand that Laodicea was a mega church in their time. And they were doing all this church stuff, and they looked very, very spiritual, like they were very, very on fire for God. And Jesus said, John, I want you to go, and I want you to read this letter to this church and this church only. He said, I want you to understand that I see you doing all the church stuff. You've got most everybody fooled, including yourselves, but not me. Jesus says, tell them I see you for who you really are. You have a form of godliness, but there's no power to back it up. You look good when you're shouting. You look good when you're singing. You have all the church to ask for to do good ministry. Jesus said, tell them they've got the state-of-the-art building, state-of-the-art ministry tools. They have state-of-the-art sound equipment and musical equipment. Everything the church experts say that you need for church growth, you've got it. You have a big, beautiful building. You have money overrunning in your financial coffers. 
You are known as the place to be, as the house on fire. But Jesus said, tell them, here's the real deal. You're lukewarm. You're not hot or cold. I wish you were one or the other, but because you're lukewarm, you turn my stomach. You make me want to spew you out of my mouth. Okay, now, here's the sad part of the whole deal. The problem with the church of Laodicea was that they did not realize they were lukewarm. That's the danger of being lukewarm. And we'll talk about that danger next week. But they thought as long as they did what churches do, they were all right with God. And the problem with a whole lot of church folk today is that we're under the same delusion. We have to come to believe that if we're doing the right church stuff, that within itself is a sign that God approves of us no matter how we live. And John 18 and 18 takes the tragedy a step further in that it says, while Peter was sitting there to see the outcome, he was warming himself with Jesus' enemies. So number two, when you are lukewarm, you will be uncomfortably warm in the company of the worldly. Luke twenty two fifty five, 55, and after they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sitting among them. I want you to really see the picture here of what's going on, church. Jesus has been arrested. He is brought into the house of the high priest. And Peter had been warned that the day would come when he will deny knowing Jesus. Yet, watch this. This blows my mind. Even though he knew what was coming, he follows from the distance but has the gall to walk in and to sit down and warm himself at the same fire at what Jesus' enemies are sitting at. Are you joking me? You would have thought that in that very moment that he would remember Jesus' words and run as far and as fast away from that situation as possible. But when you're lukewarm, hear me. What is uncomfortable can become uncomfortably comfortable to you, and then it comes again. Number three. When you're lukewarm, even the world recognizes your discomfort. Luke twenty two fifty six. and a certain girl, servant girl, seeing him, sat at the firelight and looking intently at him, said, this man was with him too. Then another one comes and says the same thing. And then about an hour later, another said the same thing. But listen to what the third one said. A little later, the bystander came up and said to Peter, surely you too are one of them, for the way you talk gives you away. Now everybody look at me. I've only been to one house party in my life. Now, I was in high school, and I went to the house party because all my brothers and sisters were going to house parties. All my friends were going to house parties. And so I decided I want to go to a house party too. So I go to a house party that night, and the first act of deliverance that God sent me is everybody was high as a kite, and two guys get in a fight and pull out a knife. I said, Lord, I've been delivered. But let me tell you the other thing that delivered me. I'm standing there holding a beer. I know I'm not going to drink. Asking for a cigarette. I know I'm not going to smoke. A guy walks up to me from my high school. He looks at me and he says, what in the world are you doing here? You don't even look like you're comfortable in this atmosphere. I said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. Let me talk to you, church. That's the way the devil will work. Some of you need to quit being fans and make up your mind to follow Jesus because you're messing up your testimony. Because people are watching you and you've got one foot in the world in the church and they're looking at you and they're saying to you what they were saying to me. What are you doing here trying to hang out with us, trying to do what we do while you know you're not comfortable here. Number four, when you are lukewarm, you will eventually do that which you swore you would never do. Luke 22, 56 to 52, we know it is the place of Peter's three denials of Jesus. In verses 60 through 62, Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. The Bible says that immediately while he was still speaking, a cock crowed. Grab verse 21. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. When I read that, all I could envision was this. Peter, as he looks up, and Jesus 
He zones in on him with those steely, anointed, Galilean eyes. And like a laser, they melt his soul. And he is disappointed. He is broken because he failed the one he really loved. Why did it happen, church? Because Peter was lukewarm. He was lukewarm, for he had not yet become a follower of Jesus, though he was following Jesus. Watch this now. Here's what happened, or didn't happen. He knew Jesus' characteristics, but he had not received the character of Jesus' spirit. Now, and I believe the saddest issue in the church of Jesus Christ that has lost a fear and a reverence of a holy God is we are ultimately creating fans rather than followers of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. Jesus did not come to build a fan base. He came to build a base of followers. Luke 9, 23 people. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Mark 16, 24 people. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You think Jesus is trying to tell us something? I'm going to talk to you about backsliding in this series. But never are we more in spiritual danger of failure than we are merely fans and not followers of Jesus. Okay, here it goes again. What's the address? First word. Second word. Third word, Jesus said, anytime you feel your feet slipping, remember Lot's wife. Watch this now. Jessica showed me a clip of a woman preacher. That's what I said, a woman preacher. So for those of you, never mind. Her name is Christine Kane, and she was hitting that thing that day. And listen to what she said. She said something powerful. If the 170 women mentioned by name or alluded to in the Bible, isn't it interesting of those 170 that Mrs. Lot was the only woman's name that Jesus calls out? Isn't it interesting that Mrs. Lot is the only woman's name Jesus called out? And he said to those around him, and he says to us today, never, 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 never forget, remember Lot's wife. You know why he said remember Lot's wife? Because watch what I'm about to say. She was moving forward physically, but kept looking back spiritually. Now watch me. When you and I look back, the first thing we need to understand is this. You cannot stay on the path you are going on if you're constantly looking back because your, 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 your ability to stay focused is off. Try doing this today, not when I'm around you. Just try driving down the street with your head turned back and just try driving. I'll come visit you in the hospital. Yeah, that's right. Might be even at your funeral. Watch this now. The second thing that happens, she was going forward and looking back. What kept her looking back? Listen to me, saints. It's because she thought that there was something better back where she had left than what's ahead of her. And so many of us keep looking back. Because we think, Deacon Siddhar, maybe I missed something back there. Let me turn around and go back and see what I missed over there. Let me talk to you about this, church. When God calls you out and brings you out, he brings you out because there, you never leave anything back there that is better than what he has ahead of you. The third reason and problem, when she kept looking back, Remember what he said? The Bible says she was paralyzed and turned into a pillar of salt. 
Watch this now. So what that means is this. She had gotten on the outskirts of the city. And the devil said, Mrs. Lot, one little peak won't hurt. And so she said, bam. She was left as a monument. Here's what I'm telling you. If the devil can't kill you, he wants to paralyze you. And if you keep looking back to what God brought you out of, eventually you will be paralyzed. And fans are always looking back. Followers of Jesus are always looking forward. Because we understand that no matter what we go through, Jesus forsook and withstood all the pain because he saw the gain that was ahead of him. And because he has gained it all, we too can gain it all, Jesus said, in this life and in the life to come. But you got to make up your mind that you're going to really, really surrender to him. And tell him today, Lord, I'm ready to make the shift. I'm ready to step one more step over to no longer being a fan, but being a follower. Everyone that would declare today, today I commit to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Why don't you rise and why don't you put down whatever you're holding and say, Lord, prepare me. Make me a sanctuary, a sanctuary for you. Come on and say it today. And say, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. So pure and holy. I don't mind if I'm tried. Oh, Let's go up now. Spirit examines us. We have two options. Either fight him or flow with him. And the safest place in all the world is not necessarily because everything is good. The safest place in all the world is in the perfect will of God. And listen, again, Sometimes struggle is the will of God for you. Struggle's not going to last forever. But listen, you can't build your faith if you turn and run every time something gets difficult. Let me say it again. The cycle of relationship with God. He takes you. He breaks you. He makes you. Every level he takes you to, he breaks you and he makes you. So at that level, you are able to receive what you need so that you don't mess up at that level. So when it comes time, you'll go to the next level. So why don't you tell him again? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Oh, pure and holy. 
I'm tried and true And with thanksgiving I'm gonna be Now lift those hands high. Don't lift them at half staff, half mass. Lift them high. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor this week. <laughs> oh, and give you his peace. Give him glory. Give him glory. It shall be done. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it's been amazing to worship with you once again. I want to remind you that to stay up to date on our upcoming events and activities, you can visit us at ehconline.org, and you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We look forward to worshiping with you next Sunday.